know how that representation of their interest and and the trillions of dollars of economic activity that flows through the Pacific and how um, our role is to is to represent their concerns on the world stage, I don't think that's understood. I, I think we're over the horizon and they could, they could care less. And to Bob's point, uh, I think the only contact that we can hope to have is uh, with the American public is through our bases uh, and through the reserve. And, and one thing that we have to really look closely at as we go through the, the next chapter here of downsizing is how we manage the reserves. Absolutely. And, and what capability and what combat support goes to the reserves and what stays in the active force. Yeah, I'll tell you what's different, to be honest with you. I'm, I'm a little older, I'm a lot older, than, I'm very much older than these guys. <laughs> and um, I came back from Vietnam in 1969 and had to immediately put on civilian clothes for fear of my life. Um, and what's changed uh, in today's generation, while the American people may not know a lot about the details of national security, they do respect uh, the sacrifice of our men and women over the last 10 years. And by the way, none of that was earned by generals. Uh, it was earned by soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines who went to repetitive tours in some of the nastiest places on the earth to, to defend us. And so one of the things I hope we will preserve um, uh, as we move away from these wars and all the acrimony begins to bubble up again is that continued societal regard for our institution which I think is the bedrock of civil military relations. Next question. Uh, the gentleman right there, you had your hand up almost every time. Yeah, please stand and tell us who you are. Thank you, my name is Munir Captain. I'm the former commander of the U.S. Constituted Iraqi Special Forces, served with the, along the U.S. forces in Iraq for seven years. First of all, I wanna say thank you. Thank you for liberating my country, regardless of the media, what the media say. Thank you as military men, not as politicians, for what you did for my country. Uh, according to uh, a report in the U.S. media yesterday, uh, by 2020, the U.S. will be independent uh, from uh, the Middle East and oil. In fact, I spoke with a gentleman in the oil business last night, and he said that uh, majority of the U.S. oil comes from Canada anyways. Uh, yet, the U.S. has the fifth fleet uh, in the region providing a lot of security, and the, the main benefactors from that is uh, Russia and China. In fact, as we speak, Iraq's uh, Nuri Maliki is selling the contract to Russia and China while ExxonMobil and Oil Hunt is, is being bullied out. So my question is, should the United States charge Russia and China for providing the security, or should uh, the United States include Russia and China as, as partners to, to share that burden? Why and why not? Thank you. Good question. Okay, fifth fleet, fifth fleet. Pat, that's yours. <laughs> Thanks, yeah, Munir. <laughs> yeah. uh, anybody that wants to partner with us, we're interested. Okay, I mean, if it, if it contributes to the overall security and stability in the region, we're interested. Um, I think the larger question for U.S. forces in the Middle East right now, naval forces, is the relationship between the United States and Bahrain. Um, there, there are significant political questions that are unresolved in terms of the future of uh, Bahraini relationships with the Shia population that, that must be addressed. And until we can get to uh, some sense of, of having a clear understanding of the way ahead, I think it, it is hard to, uh, to forecast where we will be in five or 10 years or so. The relationship that we have with Bahrain has been critical. It has been a partnership that has worked for many years uh, and most recently, due to the human rights questions, it's, it's been called into question. So um, I, I do think this is uh, the, the fundamental question that we'll have to answer in the Middle East. Uh, in terms of China or, or uh, Russia and their participation in maritime security operations, we do that with China now in terms of counter piracy. Um, you could argue whether or not it's effective, but the point is that they were willing to participate. I guess I would take just a slightly different tact on your question. I, I agree with what, what Pat's saying, but oil is, an, is a global market. It doesn't matter where it comes from. It's part of a global market, okay? And it has a global effect no matter what happens. We can have a hurricane here or a fire and put out a refinery. It has a global effect. It has a local effect, but it also has a global effect. So even if we somehow dream ourselves to energy independence, what happens to the rich tends to not always be a good thing. 
in how we behave when we have excess capability or capacity. But it is a global market. If we allow disruption of that market any place in the world, it's going to have second and third order effects that will affect us. And so the assurance that that oil and that market continues to go, access assurance for the world, not just for the United States, is critical to our well-being. We have to look at it that way. Um, and, and we should work on energy policy at home and understand and diversify it, et cetera. And to the extent that we somehow imagine ourselves to become energy independent does not mean we're globally independent. And we have to be careful there. And so that's one of the things when you sit down and think your way through a strategy, you have to look at those second and third order effects because we live in a global community now. We are not in isolation. Even if we want to go back to isolation, we can't. We'll be affected. Yeah, I think, uh, I think the two 800-pound gorillas that are hiding in the national security closet, terrible metaphor, uh, are, um, <laughs> are uh, oil and nukes. Uh, oil and nukes. That's what separates our relationship with the Persian Empire in the 1930s and what, what changes in the, in the 21st century. It's not because we like or dislike the Persians anymore or the Iraqis or anyone else in that era. But it's those two issues that are, have so enormously changed the global attentions of not just us, but all of the world, oil and nukes. There's Next, someone here. had a question? Okay. Yes, sir, please. Jump, yes, sir, you. Just wait for the, <laughs> there you go. Reality by. And, and you are? I'm Larry Saul, uh, and a member of the Tower Center Forum. Uh, Reality bites, as a philosopher once said, I don't know which one, uh, but the budget for the military is going to be cut. We know that. It'll probably be done by Congress, which is probably the worst way it could be done. If you had your choice, how would you select the cuts that will be made that would do the least damage to our national security? Let me just try one word on you, and that's balance. Balance. If you know who your enemies are and you're fairly certain of what the, of where the next war will come, then you can be unbalanced. If you are unsure, then you have to base it on two things. One is capabilities, which is enormously amorphous, uh, and the other is uh, past patterns of behavior, as I said earlier. You cannot be specific. Uh, you have to build a multi-capable force, a joint force, multi-capable force which is adequate in all three dimensions, or four or five now, air, sea, space, air, sea, land, space, and cyberspace. Um, and it has to be moved and maneuvered. Oh, here's the other issue. And the other issue is, before you seek radical shifts in the budget, just be very, very, very careful. Because what's at, what's at stake is the security of the, of, of the nation uh, and our treasure. So while many seek to have radical shifts in the balance within the budget and among the forces and capabilities and technologies, all I can say is push hard on technologies because that's been our edge in the past, but be very, very careful how you manipulate the existing balance. I think that's a good answer. We ought to just stick with it. <laughs> hey, uh, I, I'm sorry. I, I would uh, add to, to uh, what Bob was saying that as you, as you exercise balance in the downsizing, you've got to have some sort of expansion points built into this with industry so that we don't assume a way that we can call on industry when time comes to the point that Bob's making. So uh, I, I think the challenge that we have today more than anywhere else is the brittleness that we have inside industry, that we're, we're changing ones that exist for whatever platform it is. And when you change that one to a zero, you now have a real industry impact in terms of whether or not that, that's going to be around anymore. I'd also, I'd also suggest we rebuild the institutional base of all the services. Uh, we've been a nation at war for 10 years. We've built a learning bathtub, if you will, of, of uh, young uh, men and women who have not been back to school. Uh, our institutions of learning are broken, in my opinion. Um, and my fear is that we'll build a generation who view tactical success uh, as the pathway to strategic leadership. In other words, I was a successful company commander. Or I flew F-18s over Iraq, therefore, you know, I'm, I'm good at what I do, and the truth is that you're not. And so my hope is that 
as part of the budget. One of the things we don't cut, in fact, if anything, we enhance, uh, is, uh, is our institutional schools and, and sending uh, uh, young officers back to places like SMU, where they back to civil military relations over here as part of their reconnection with the American people after 10 years of war. They can connect to people who are going to question their judgment in a place like this, uh, rather than just being part of your, being part of your tribe. L let me throw a couple hand grenades into the discussion. Uh, um, if you look at the defense budget, um, uh, the largest majority, 40 to 50 percent is people, uh, as you look at the defense, entire defense budget. Um, and so we've got to figure out a way uh, to be able to be more, in business terms, more productive with our people. Now, I don't, I don't like to throw stones at my Army colleagues, but I'll do it here momentarily. And that is that, is that um, you can take an infantry guy and make him so much more productive. You can give him a longer range weapon, you can let him see over the next hill, et cetera. You take the infantry guy and put him in a B2, and he can do a hell of a lot of damage all over the world. So. That's an example, and I'm not arguing for less infantry, guys. What I'm arguing for is we've got to figure out how to do the missions we need to do with less people. Uh, we, we talked last night about UAVs or drones. Uh, the Air Force calls them remotely piloted aircraft because there's nothing unmanned about them. There are the crew ratio for your average uh, UAV is, is a, about seven times larger than it is for an F-16. Uh, so, so we've got to figure out how to get these things to talk to, together, how one guy can fly several of them at the same time. We've got to do some productivity enhancements. That's going to take money. Uh, another example is if you want to spend less energy in the Department of Defense, you're going to have to, sp in a very simple fashion, you're going to have to put in insulation. You're going to have to get rid of old buildings. You're going to have to build new, uh, new buildings. You're going to have to do things that maybe you are in the short term counterproductive, but in the longer term, more effective. We're also going to have to get after overhead. OSD is the largest it's ever been in history. I don't mean it badly. Office of Secretary of Defense has got more SESs in it, senior level civilians in it, than any of the services, than actually the Army and the Air Force combined. Um, the agency budgets are now eating up an increasing share of the DOD budget. In fact, the Air Force budget is now below 20%, and it's almost, it's about 3% more than the sum of all the agencies that are out there. So we're going to have to get back, I believe, to get back to basics in terms of trying to deal with some of these, these issues. Um, but General Cartwright is much smarter on this than, than I am. Next. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, hey, Mike, can I, can I follow up with just one point? Uh, if you, if you were to look at cost drivers inside a Department of Defense, which is the point that Mike's making, um, procurement is number three. You got manpower, operations and maintenance, and procurement. And yet, when we do the quadrennial defense review that Bob referred to, uh, we focus on procurement. What we really need is an approach that takes into account the readiness levels that Haas talked about, the, the response times that are built into the budget. That, that is a huge cost driver to have people that can respond, forces to respond in five days and be able to take the actions, the consequential actions that he's talking about. That level of readiness is very high and very expensive. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Jim? I'll get you guys up here in just a minute. I'll get you up there now. Jim Hollifield, uh, director of the Tower Center. It seems to me that a vital function for our military is to be able to project our force and this may be a little bit of a provocative question, but are some of the services, well, number one, in what areas must we be able to project our force? You know, I'm just thinking something like protection of the sea lanes uh, as an example. Um, and are some of the services better, more critical in force projection than, in, uh, than other services? Thank you. Well, I, I'll, let me start. I, I'll criticize my own service. Um, you know, it's funny. Our weapons procurement is on a sign, speaking of the Army, is on a sign curve that is, that is uh, a half an order behind conditions in the world. Um, when I was ahead of Army after next, we were talking about uh, 19 to 31 ton armored fighting vehicles that would be able to get to a theater of war within 36 hours, followed by fast sea lift. Uh, to compliment our friends in the Marine Corps and get there early in order to do what Haas just talked about. 
And then all of a sudden, we completely, I guess, driven by uh, IEDs and so forth, then we began to heavy up again. Um, and then we have driving around in uh, M-ramps that are bigger than the battleship Missouri. Um, and, and totally non-deployable, completely non-deployable. Well, now all of a sudden, the Army is beginning to rediscover the importance of uh, strategic uh, operational maneuver from strategic distances or maneuver from the sea or whatever the, the, the term is right now. And yet the Army is about to build an 84-ton infantry carrier. So this is to Haas's earlier point that it takes about 12 to 15 years to develop a system. But conditions in the, <laughs> conditions in the world and uh, sort of uh, operational, uh, 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 operational um, uh, theory du jour is that we tend to change our minds faster than we can build equipment to, to coincide with our national strategy. So we got to do one or two things. Strow to, slow down this, evol this sign curve of, 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 of strategic populism or find a way to accelerate our, a pace of, of developing systems. I think, uh, I mean, you, you can go in a number of different ways on this one. I, one that is really important in my mind uh, is that we have driven military capabilities to the upper right-hand corner of exquisite, okay? And that's okay, but we've, we've lost scale. Right. So if we're going to be global, one B-2 or one aircraft carrier or one division it's just not enough. It can't be in the right places at the right time to influence before it has to fight. And so somehow we have to understand the value of people and the cost of people, but we've also got to understand the cost of scale versus exquisite. And if we do only exquisite, we end up with Battlestar Galactica, but it's in the wrong place. I mean, it just, it's just the reality of it. And so we have to understand how we're going to get back to scale and there are ways to do it. I mean, technology is taking us in ways that will give us scale, but we have to understand scale again, and we, we've, we're sort of losing that. Yeah, I agree. That's very, very good. So when it comes to uh, the deployability of the force, we have a deployment model that I think most services <coughs> would uh, have something close to it, but approximately one-third of the fleet underway, one-third in training or one-third in maintenance. Uh, so you have groups that are going and coming, you have groups that are uh, taking time for long-term maintenance. Uh, where we are today is about 49% of the Pacific Fleet would be underway. And what that does is it robs us of the sorts of decisions we need to make for long-term maintenance. Uh, what it means is uh, an aircraft carrier we can get 50 years out of, uh, but if we continue to operate that way, it'll be something less than that. So you'll see us retiring ships earlier than programmed or expected because the maintenance bills have backed up and have become so expensive with typically older, older hulls that uh, it's actually cheaper to get rid of them. Well, there's no guarantee there's any replacement. So now we're looking at numbers that do affect uh, the ability to, to be able to just uh, respond. Yeah, I, I tell you, you know, I absolutely agree with that. I mean, you know, you can lean too forward in the foxhole. Um, and, and we have an op tempo today for all the services, not just the Navy, that really isn't justified by global conditions. I mean, why do we have this Army Force Generation model that, is, that, that mimics what the Navy is doing in terms of one-third, one-third, one-third? You know, what's the rush? And the money that you could save by perhaps scaling back some of that uh, might very well allow us to go uh, and amplify our numbers. You know, Lennon once said quantity has a quality all of its own. Uh, and mass does matter in war. Uh, even in uh, counterinsurgency wars, mass matters. And if, if, you're, if you're spending just to, just to steam or drive or fly, if that's what it's about, then maybe part of our strategy as we wind down from Afghanistan uh, ought to be to rethink uh, these uh, these models of military readiness that just continue to crank out and generate forces for combat. Uh, Bob, great point, because that generates bills. And, right. And I, I, I want to ask you to think about, and, and David's here and, and Haas is here, um, look at the structure of how our organization works. We're matrixed. So you have combatant commanders along one axis, and you've got the services along the other. The guy who's sending the, the fire alarm back to the Pentagon is the combatant commander who pays no bills. 
The service is the one that has to pony up without objection, find money, and make it happen. I've seen other models. For example, if you were to look at the joint staff in Australia, uh, they actually have money assigned to the joint staff, so the three there has, has the checkbook, so that when the order is issued, uh, he's got to write the check, he's got to balance the books. Seems to me structurally we got to figure out a way to, to reorient ourselves. Uh, I, I would also just, just add that uh, <laughs> as the world grows more complex, it's going to make uh, projecting power much, much more difficult. And all you have to do is look at Afghanistan and the northern route and the southern route and what it takes to get in there. For, for close to a year, we were hauling nothing but almost nothing but fuel that we could use to operate and then get out of Afghanistan because of the blockage of some of the routes. So the complexity of the international environment is going gonna, is gonna to be, is, uh, is going to drive what it takes to project force. Yeah, you know, in the 1998 Army After Next War, Strategic War Games, we came up with scenarios, and one of them was Afghanistan. Uh, and the Joint Staff and the Army Staff all jumped on me, saying, no, the United States could never fight a war in Afghanistan. It's far too remote and inaccessible. Um, the, the, the other thing, I think, as we wind down, we need to find ways to coin a term. We need to find ways to civilianize more how we operate in the military. Uh, I don't think we've done enough of that, to give you an example. Uh, to fill the learning bathtub, you can't do it with, with years, because there's only a 25-year limit on how much time a soldier, sailor, airman, or marine serves, and most of that has to be in an operational assignment. We haven't done anywhere near enough in getting a chapter from you in academia on distance learning and on distributed learning. Uh, we haven't engaged properly, uh, I think, uh, academia to get ideas about how to reset and restructure ourselves. There's so many things that we can learn, but we've become so introverted over the last 10 years. We've become this enormous self-licking ice, uh, ice cream cone where, where, where you know, only the joy of eating the ice cream is what's important to us. What we, boy, that's another bad man. But, but what, we, but what I, I think increasingly we can save a lot of money by looking outward instead of looking inward, and I think that's one of the values of this symposium. Oh, absolutely. As an example, you could privatize learning in the military and it, it would be a disaster. Or you could learn from civilian learning because, let's face it, SMU has a budget. You're a private school. And if you bust your return on investment, you go bankrupt. Uh, so, but there aren't those limits and constrictors on anything from medical care, retirement benefits, uh, uh, learning. Uh, gosh, just go down the list of things that really cost money. And I'm just not sure the military has gone as far as they, that by the way, I was on the QDR, 2008 QDR. And one of the things we addressed was things like that. Sound prosaic to you, they're not aircraft carriers or fighter planes, but they cost a lot of money. Medical care, retirement, how long do you serve? How do you learn? How do you build institutions that are more civilian-like? And you don't do it with contractors. There's a, uh, I'm, uh, let me get the gentleman in the back. I'll just Can't, project if that's okay. Um, by all means. My name is Christian Blackwell, and when I'm not earning Army War College credits... Uh, You're the man. you got three more. <laughs> uh, when I'm not earning that, I deal with startups and innovation. And what I find interesting is that uh, in the commercial world, uh, two major trends that we spend our time talking about are technology and globalization, and both of which drive costs down. In thinking about national security, and in this conversation, we talk about globalization, in various ways. We talk about technology, both of which drive costs up. So my question is, what opportunities are there when we decrease budgets to take advantage of what we're seeing in the private sector to change that, that uh, ironic situation? That's a great question. Um, you know, it, 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 it's interesting, and I, I don't uh, contest uh, how, how you projected it, but for me, the last 10 years have been sitting in that seat that that essentially does that um, kind of activity. And, and I agree that going into the conflict, you know, we didn't take advantage of what industry could do for us in innovation, what um, the universities could do for us in education and, and innovation. Um, but when you go into war, and this is historical, you know, almost any conflict you've ever been in, uh, go back as far as you want. Um, the relationship between the military 
and industry, the relationship between the, between the military and medicine, science, technology, and innovation becomes so symbiotic. Um, you cannot win if it isn't. The last 10 years for me, being in charge of making sure every day when I got up that everybody on the battlefield had the, had the, had the cutting edge of advantage, small business and universities were at the heart of that for the last 10 years, all of it. Um, big business figured out how to bring it to market, but it came from small business and universities. I mean, I lived on those people, um, and it wasn't, gee, Greenfield type stuff. It was get up in the morning and call MIT or call SMU. I need this invented, and I need it now. What do you need to make sure that your scientist can have an environment to actually produce? And you just, you had to do, you have to do it. The things that have come out of this 10 years, you don't want to look at it from this perspective, but it, it will historically be true. The, the movement in medicine that gave us 99% survivability, unbelievable. Um, the movement in computational power that today gave you the cloud was how we gathered information on the battlefield. It was invented there. The internet and where it is in 4G today came from that. I mean, it is, it is that engine. Now, I agree, we don't want to lose that now. And that's the first thing that gets shed in the investment side of the equation. We, get, we turn inward to the self-licking ice cream cone. That's, we have to worry about that. But industry will, in fact, benefit, as will society, from it. When we leave Afghanistan, you know what will still be there for the next 100 years? this. Biggest culture changing thing in the world. Okay? It will. That's what will be there. What was in Bosnia when we arrived there? The infrastructure